Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have here today a longtime colleague and a real luminary in light. Her name is Rebecca Baruki. She is a mom. She's a teacher. She's the founder of Beck's Life and Blissed In. It's a massive wellness movement. She's the mother of five humans. She is a TV host. She is a meditation and yoga teacher, a birth doula, and she is the author of a book called You Have Four Minutes to Change Your Life. Her new book, Managing the Mother Load, is where she makes mental health support and stress management tools accessible to all. She's a powerhouse. Rebecca, it's so nice to have you here. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so happy to be here. So (laughs) interesting because right before we started recording, I was in the most frantic state, but hearing your voice, you're you're magic. I'm completely calm now. (laughs) Bless you. And I was just noting on your bio, we both auditioned for Varia, that TV platform Mm -hmm. back Mm -hmm. in the day. You ended up taking taking that forward uh, with a show called Got Zen. Yes. I thought it might be interesting just to talk about your experience there for a moment because they had a really good, you know, solid professional enterprise there. I would love to hear some of how it went. It was a really good experience. It was a tremendous learning experience, one of the Mm. most, um, or one of the first, I don't know how to bring this in, but that is where I learned how my palatability as a black biracial woman, um, but a very light skinned one, what light skinned one was, um, was marketable, (laughs) was an asset of mine. Um, and yeah, when I was hired for the show, we met at a dinner when they were doing this other project and I went through with that project. And then I went back to audition for a show. And after I was hired for the show, they asked me what my ethnicity was. And I told them I was black biracial and they said, Oh, that's so wonderful. How (gasps) ambiguously Brown you are. Oh no. Yeah. (laughs) And I, yes. And, um, you know, I, I hate to bring up the negative, but that was the most striking that's the most striking memory I have of that experience because it really solidified how important it is for me as this person who gets to walk into many spaces and navigate these spaces with a lot of ease, how important it is for me to always push forward the message of accessibility, inclusivity, diversity, and, um, that was, yeah, that was the starting point for where I took my activism and infused it into my work. So thanks for bringing wow. that up. I didn't know I was going to talk about that. So thank I, you. I didn't know either. <laughs> Frankly, I did not even know your ethnicity. So please teach us where you grew up, who your parents are, and anything else that seems relevant. Oh, so that's another, you know, that's another story in and of itself. I was raised in a white family. Both of my, the parents that raised me were white. My mother was my biological uh, mother. I am not to go down this rabbit hole, but I was the product of a extramarital affair. Um, so they chose to keep me after much debate. Um, she and her husband, who I call my my dad, but they chose to keep me and raise me as a white person. <gasps> theirs, but as theirs, as theirs. And the and, extramarital affair was with a black man. Yes, yes. So, and pet, it's the story is so common. The story is so common. The, it's common that these children would be given up for adoption. I was talking about this with um, Dr. Christiane Northrup, and she said how wow. you know she's so familiar, or she's witnessed, or been part of so many 
um, adoptions where there was an affair and then they had to give up the child. Um, but because I was passing enough, mm. um, even as a baby, it made it easier for them. It became very apparent as I got older that I didn't belong to this redheaded woman and blonde <laughs> gentleman, but um, which caused other issues. But I had known from a very young age, even though it was unspoken, that I was, you know, that something was going on. And then the truth was revealed to me in my teen years. And then I was given the name of my biological father when I was 32 years old. Um, Dude. Yeah, <laughs> wow. I know. I know. That's so, such a big story. It is a big story, but it's... um. It's one that has served me well, again, in my work, in my activism, in being able to navigate spaces and being able to have an understanding. Um, and I would never claim to have an understanding of what it's like to be a darker skinned black woman. That's it's out of my lane. But to have an understanding what it's like to be an other, you know, mm -hmm. in almost every space, especially in the very white world of wellness, especially there. <sighs> There's such a big topic here. <laughs> I'm I sorry. Wanna, no, 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 it's fine. I actually am so committed to understanding and, and uh, mm -hmm. also navigating it that I'm interviewing Ruth King in a few weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I've been learning from her book and all of her interviews, you know, which I'm lapping up. I want to talk about the white world of wellness, but I also feel like mm -hmm. it's important to cover your book because the, yes. the real contribution I see you making is not one that regards race. It's one that regards motherhood. Mm. The, the way that you show up in social media where you are at turns, both completely humorous and irreverent mm -hmm. and also completely profoundly sacred with regards to your work as a parent of five. Mm -hmm. I am very impressed by this and it's why I wanted to have you on the podcast. I feel like you see it all as a practice. I feel like you have let go of a lot of the assumptions that people have put upon you and mm -hmm. you're doing it your way. You know, Motherhood is absolutely a practice as much as meditation is. It is my spiritual practice. It's my journey. I have been a mother forever since I've been 18 years old. So I don't know. I don't know womanhood without motherhood. Mm. Um, for me, my experience uh, with my story of race is very much infused in the way that I mother because that, again, that feeling of other. Um, my oldest child has a, a very rare connective tissue disorder that affects her mobility. Sometimes she uses a, a cane or a wheelchair. I have two boys that have ocular albinism, which causes legal blindness. Um, it's a, a very severe visual impairment. I have a trans son. <laughs> I have, it's like my children run the gamut of others and my experience has created a level of compassion, but also an understanding that it is so important for them to find their way in the way that I feel that I don't necessarily belong to my parents, or actually I don't belong to my parents. I was just given to them, you know, for them to watch over me while I was growing. Um, I feel the same about my children, like, you know, like the Rumi quote, oh, you know, children wow. move through us, they don't come from us. So it's, um, we're all kind of like this gang of misfit toys in this house, mm. finding our way. <laughs> um, so everything informs everything, <laughs> you know? And um, mothering to me is, is oh gosh, it's, it's a, mothering is a connection to other people that need love, affection, nourishment, care. So while my book is is written for mothers of human children, it's also for anyone who nurtures and cares for other people and needs to create space for themselves and, and maintain their own identity. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. Every single one of your children has a really serious need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also comes with profoundly beautiful gifts. Obviously. The needs are, it's like 
the need is their gift at the same time. It's like two sides of the same coin Mm -hmm. um, because they're also um, brilliant, intelligent, wonderful, charismatic, bright and shiny. Like I just think that they're so great. Um, Can I say something about you for a moment? You must, but I just I'm obsessed right now with you. I can't. No, I, 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 everything you told me is now just I'm bursting out of my skin. I don't know where to begin. So I want to tell you how much you influenced my book. Um, a while back, and I've shared this with you in person, but a while back, um, right before my mother passed, I, I lost both of my parents in 2013, seven months Oof. apart. And oh. right before my mother passed, um, we were estranged. We were having, um, the argument was actually about a book that I was going to write about my story about, you know, being biracial and and that whole thing. And she felt that I was violating her trust. So we weren't speaking and you reached out to me because you saw something that I posted online and you said that what I don't he, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but what I don't heal with my mother will be repeated with my with my daughter or my children. And I was so mad at you. <laughs> I was so mad at you. <laughs> I got on the phone and first I sobbed because I felt the truth of it. And then it was, how dare she? And she doesn't even know me. And mm. lo and behold, <laughs> years later, um, not with my daughter, um, but with my son, my oldest son, we entered into an estrangement that was <sighs> nearly identical. And I talk about this in the book, nearly identical to the one that I had with my mother. And it took my younger sister saying, don't you see it? Don't you see that you're her and he's you? And then that your message came flooding back into my head. And I was like, damn it, Elena Brower. (laughs) (laughs) And that was what your words. And then what I had learned over the years, the healing that I had done over the years allowed me to deconstruct that situation, look at it with more truth and clarity and put myself on a path to healing. So I write that I write about that in the book too, even though we're still in the midst of it. We're wow. still in the midst of it. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's really good to hear. But I unfortunately cannot take credit for it because it's really Lauren Xander. It is Lauren Xander. God damn <laughs> I love it. her so much. That's all for She's responsible for that business. Yeah, she's in my book a lot too. I'm sure. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm so sure. Well, here's what I have to say to you about all of this. You're a brave fucking woman and I'm excited to know you. I'm excited that you took all of it on. I wonder um, if you could share with us a little bit about how, if it's appropriate or allowed, how Mm -hmm. you fixed it with your kid. Mm, Okay, so I can tell my part of it. Yeah. So, and, and honestly, it was all my part of it. Because I can't deal with his part of it, right? Mm. (laughs) So it was um, reminding myself that my predictions and my plans for him are complete figments of my imagination. They're hopes, dreams, wishes that don't really mean anything when it comes to the reality of the way things are going to be. So I needed to detach from those stories. I needed to say that, you know, he could be, in my opinion, messing up really bad right now and still turn out to be a phenomenal human being. Mm. And actually, I had to hold space for him being a phenomenal human being. And all the things that were happening right now were going to lead him to that point because I was a complete asshole when I was 18 years old, like 17, 18, 19. And I, I'm fine. I'm, I'm better than fine. I'm better for it. So I let go of that. I had to remind myself that he does not belong to me, that this is his journey. And the more that I inject myself into that, the more I prevent him from actually learning the lessons that he needs to learn. So if I save him now, quote unquote, save him now, he's going to be dealing with it maybe when he doesn't have a safety net, maybe when I'm not around. You know, my parents died and I wish so many times I could go back to them, to, into their arms to speak to them and tell them what's hurting me now, how much I need them now. And I can't, 
So I needed to create that space, that soft space for him to land now while he's going through it. So he can maybe heal before he is on his own for real. And I stepped back. And I, and I also, the biggest part of it, the biggest part was maybe this is actually our relationship at its best. Maybe this is what it is. It doesn't have to get better. This is great. We check in once a week via text. Um, every couple weeks we get lunch. Once a month, maybe he comes by the house for a dinner. And this is what it is. He's a grown man living his life. And this is the relationship that we have. Ugh. And that was the hardest part because I want him always. I want him here always. But it's, um, it's not for me to say. Right. Oh my God, yeah. they're 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 so old. <laughs> they're so <laughs> old. It's so weird. They were little babies yeah. like five minutes ago. Little babies in your arms. Oh my gosh, yes, little babies that. And you know what? I still I still see that little baby, and that's the part that I'm never going to let go of. That's actually they're the hardest forever. part. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do it. They're still my babies, but also they're my babies that. They're my babies, but they're the world's human adult person yeah. who needs to live their life and do good. Yeah. That has helped me a great yeah. deal to think about the child of the universe. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just passing through my house. Yeah. It's so profound. Um, I'm proud of you for getting to that place. It's not an easy uh, transition to realize. It's the hardest. Yeah. It's the, har it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It, 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 the pain was so deep. It was, I've never cried. Yeah. I've never wailed like I did yeah. through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a death. Um, I remember when Jonah was about three or four and I read that somewhere, this whole, a similar story, not quite the same, obviously, but a similar story. And uh, I started then to kind of detach I've shared that with a couple of people and they thought I was absolutely out of my mind, but now he's 13 and I'm more than happy for him to go take the taxi by himself, walk mm -hmm. to the store by himself. Like I'm cool with him having a great deal of autonomy, perhaps more than some of his peers receive mm -hmm. because of it. So I think it's a gift in the end to, if you're a parent listening to this, start now, honestly, to see that person that you're holding in your arms and see that person who's a toddler, you know, wrecking your house and um, <laughs> ransacking your sleep. Uh, see that person as just a person passing through. And one of the best books I've read, I've mentioned it here before, Voice Lessons for Parents by Wendy Mogel. Yes. What a, what a, what a treasure trove. And she suggests that for teen boys, you look at the child as a, as an exchange student from another country. <laughs> and how would you treat that person? You know, you wouldn't take it's, his actions personally. You wouldn't right. be so mad or connected or attached to the outcome. You would just be a host. Just a host. It, uh, and it's, it's, oh gosh, that's so interesting. First of all, I stopped yelling at my kids because of you. I was such a yeller and Ugh. I you've told the story so many times how you were a yeller and I started doing the whisper thing that you mentioned, like whispering the instructions, which felt funny and weird and they thought I was crazy. Um, it works. Though. I started doing that. Though. Yeah. And now I'm I have been yelling or I would say rage sober yep. since March eighth of this year. Very good. Um, because it was an addiction of mine to be angry Very good. all the time. Same. Um so there's that. Um, but on the, on the point of the exchange student, my husband and I have been, we're in the very early stages of becoming foster parents um, because our children are, the youngest is going into school and we have the space and we have the love and all that. So, so we're looking into being foster parents and he was struggling with that because he's just like, how are we going to have this child and let it go potentially? Or how are, you know, how are we going to love it enough? Will we love it as much as our children? And the one gift, even though my parents, oh my gosh, so flawed as we all are, so flawed my parents were, one of the very biggest, the best gifts they gave me was um, this, this real feeling that all, we're all brothers and sisters, truly, mm. 
this, we really are one family, Mm -hmm. no borders, none of that. And we are, and all of the world's children, I feel are my children. The only difference is I know mine and I like them. Like they're cool. Like they're my close friends. We hang out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, I'm, I think that when these children come into my house, the lesson of understanding that my children are just passing through is going to allow me to serve them so much more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But I'm, oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. (laughs) It is so hard. It is so hard. But once you learn it, it's not only a gift to yourself, but it allows your children to feel trusted, worthy, seen, respected, honored. When you give them that autonomy, yes. it's like, wow, they, they trust me. Yep. How amazing is that? My kids started cooking for me this week after being away with yes. me for two weeks and getting <laughs> lots of free time by himself. And I'm so psyched. Um, <laughs> That's a good one. A <laughs> couple of slight divergence, and, and then I want to talk mm-hmm. about the book. You, you posted an Ali Horde quote. My husband and I decided to start saying, quote, I need attention. And honestly, it's a real relationship mm. time saver. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell me about that because it's so good. And it's so uh, it's, it's just the heart of communication in a relationship at its finest. Well, that's a Lauren Zander lesson. For sure. <laughs> that, that radical truth, yep. that cutting through all the BS and saying, what am I really asking for right now? Mm. And oh my gosh, it was, it was Lauren Zander, and I'll, and I'll bring another couple names into the mix. Alexandra Jameson and her husband, Bob Gower, created this method called the ICBD method, and I outline it in the book. And it stands for intention, concern, boundary, desire. And it's a way to like construct a conversation, build a conversation so that all the parts, it's a very holistic way of communicating. Mm. And it's, you know, my intention, what do I want? Concern, what am I afraid will happen if we have this conversation? How you might react, how I might react. Boundaries, like this is where I'm willing to go right now and please honor that. And then the desire part is so great because it's what is my big dream for this conversation? What do I want to come out of this? And my husband and I, and I use it with my kids too, because we can be applied to every single conversation, big and small. But my husband and I, the way that we've learned to communicate is just, it's like uses fewer words, which is awesome. It's great for him because he's, he's not as flowery with his speech as I am, mm-hmm. but it's, um, Hey, I don't like that that hurts. Um, I just want to let you know that um, what you said hurt me. I'm afraid that you're going to feel like I'm attacking you by or criticizing you. Mm. Um, I just want you to know that as far as boundaries go, I just, I just want to be able to say this without you interrupting. Um, because at the end of this, I just want us to be better to each other and like really be honest without any fear. Mm. It's that easy yep. and um, saves time. Yeah. Lots of time. Um, creates real intimacy, (laughs) which is awesome. Um, The vows of marriage where we say, hey, we're in this together forever. It removes the doubt of that because it's like, oh yeah, we can, we can handle anything that comes our way. It's because we have this open communication. It's funny how when the communication gets better, you stop worrying about whether or not this is the last person you'll have sex with. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I still worry about that. Sometimes. I did too. So, yes. <laughs> I think I did too, actually. Is this it? Is this, is this really, really it? it? <laughs> but. Well, you know, there's all kinds of, you can, that can be fluid too. So it's up to you. There is. But, but I feel like when the communication is good, I don't, I'm not lacking or looking. Nope. You know what I mean? Nope. Just like, oh, I can be there honest. Is no lack. You can be honest. Where nothing is missing here. Because it's the whole story. Yeah. It's the when you're speaking the whole story, you're hearing the whole story. There is no lack. There's nothing missing. There's no like I'm I wonder what they really mean. Yeah. And you are mm-hmm. sober also, question mark, or no? I'm I would not say that I'm sober because I, I don't drink, smoke drugs, anything, but that is not a conscious um, effort to avoid um, an addiction or to not be an addiction. Um, but I do come from a family of addicts. Right. 
Um, I think that my addiction shows up in codependence, in rage. Um, so I'm sober from that. Got it. I was asking because mm -hmm. you had posted fairly recently, we don't need a drink. We need a break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't need mm -hmm. rosé. We need a rest. We yes. don't mm -hmm. deserve wine. We deserve love. Right. And I, and you can replace, yeah, as you know, yeah. the wine, the rosé with any, any numbing agent. Right. So emotional food, anything. Right. Yeah. Talk about managing the mother load. You've mentioned a couple of aspects of it so far, but I think this is going to be of great use and benefit to a lot of mothers and families in general. Um, it looks so beautiful. I want to encourage mm -hmm. my listener to go to bexlife.com forward slash book, because there, if you buy the book there, you're getting a bunch of bonus gifts. So make sure you register yes. your purchase with Rebecca, bexlife.com forward slash book, because you'll get a bunch of other things. Um, tell us a little bit about the book and then I'll jump in. So the book was one I didn't want to write. Right. Um, my lovely publisher, Hay House, rejected the proposal for my second book, the one that I did want to write, the one I thought I needed to write, right? Like I was like, this is the book. Um, so they rejected the proposal. I got the rejection while I was in bed, miscarrying a pregnancy, oh, losing a God. pregnancy. Um, so it was my seventh pregnancy, my second miscarriage. It was a painful, very dramatic one, um, for me. And, uh, so I got this rejection and I was devastated. And in the notes in my proposal, they saw this mention of a talk that I had given, Managing the Mother Load in a little mini digital download I created. And they said, that's such a great title. And you have five kids. Why don't you write about this? And I, it was another moment like, damn you, <laughs> universe, hey house, how dare you? Um, because I was estranged from my son. I was miscarrying. I was struggling in my marriage. I was, it, it couldn't have been a worse time for me to write about how great of a mother I am or to give advice. So I said, um, after a few days and still in bed, yeah, I'll write it but it's not going to be a parenting book because I am not qualified to write that book. I'm going to write about motherhood and my journey and what it means to me to be a mother and how it's formed or informed every single aspect of my being. Um, so that's the book I'm going to write. How I created dreams, um, made dreams come true in the context of motherhood. How I've really become the person I want to be, even though sometimes I hate her <laughs> in the context of motherhood. Um, so I wrote the proposal in a day, um, this new proposal and sent it off and um, they liked it and they accepted it. And I was mad again, because I didn't want to write the book and I labored through this one. Mm. I didn't want to do it. It felt, I felt like a fraud. So this, the book begins with me saying that this is not a parenting book because I don't feel qualified. And it begins telling the story of my estrangement with my oldest son. And um, because I wanted to put that out on the table that, you know, this is motherhood too. Right. Because um, I'm sick of the glossy images. I'm sick of, oh my gosh, the Pinterest, Instagram. Uh, it's, I mean, motherhood is that too. But if that's the whole picture, we're all doomed. Doomed. <laughs> doomed. <laughs> It's, I thank God every day that I had children before the internet, like my first, my oldest were born before I had a computer and social media wasn't a thing because with its many blessings, oh my gosh, it would have made me feel like I didn't know what I was I doing. I could not agree more with that statement. I don't know what our kids are going to do, but it's a completely different <sighs> world. They grew up with it. They, they don't know life without it. I'm, yeah. I'm vexed by this every day. But we're still human. I think it's yeah. it still affects them. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel um I feel like your book is gonna help a lot of people. I, I like the fact that you start with such a um an open dialogue about the truth of your scene over there. And I appreciate the fact mm -hmm. that um <laughs> you in the book you're you're sort of focusing on the tiniest triumphs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, directing in a way, reminding all of us, as I, I know that you're just reminding yourself really, but reminding all of us to celebrate that 
those little moments where things go well to that's all there is I know and you know they they there was a meditation teacher once who said those are the the pearls on the strand and as mm -hmm. you put one pearl on top of another you eventually end up with a beautiful necklace and it's it's like that when you're a parent like you have one moment of full connection uh where i don't know i consider a triumph when jonah asked me to help him make his bed and i just say yes and his whole body mm -hmm. just like completely discharges and we're there just doing it together one of my children's in therapy right now and um they said to me yesterday when we were leaving a session i said how did it go and they were like um that was the best hour ever i wish it could have been too and I said, are you sure? Because you get really excited about stuff and then you want to, <laughs> then you want to like not do it right. anymore. And they said, well, you know, I, um, I'm going to complain every single time, but I just want you to know right now that I, I really like it and I'm glad you made me go. <laughs> that. <laughs> that was a pearl. I was like, lock it up. <laughs> lock that shit in the safe. <laughs> Oh, I do. And it's those moments. It's because if, if the truth is that all we have is mm. now, then how many big moments do we really have in our I lives? Know. You know, it's like birth, marriage, big celebration. How many big moments do we really have? It really is all the tiny ones. So I cherish those like, like pearls, like gold. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. I, uh, I <clears throat> usually ask my guests three of the same questions every time. The first mm -hmm. is what needs healing right now for you or around you? Um, what needs healing or I would say correction is the myth, the false idea, the lie that we are separate from one another. Mm -hmm. It's a Thank lie. You. Is there anything on that in managing the mother load? Or is that sort of the umbrella under which the book falls, basically? The book, the theme of the book is the cycles of a seed of nature and how motherhood mimics that in the garden. Um, I also bring in the moon a lot because that was something that my mother mm. loved. So it's our connection to nature. But I talk a lot about the village and how yeah. I think our deepest hurts come from separation from one another and how a village on oh my, my community, my sisterhood is everything. Right. I'm nothing without my, my sister. That is so true. Mm -hmm. And what is your favorite view? These answers span many different, um, answers. So you can just go to town with your first intuitive hit. Okay, I'm going to take that literally. <laughs> my my psych view, my favorite view is sitting on my sun porch, watching my three youngest, um, and the oldest of the youngest is 16, watching them wrestle and scream and run around in the backyard uh, while the chickens and the goats and the pigs look on horrified. <laughs> like, what are these crazy humans that's doing? Right. That's my favorite That's right. view. You, you yeah. live on a farm. What? How many acres? It's like we eight acres, a, yeah. right? It's eight acres, and it is a farm that grows no food, and we um, we adopt misfit animals. <laughs> so it's all they're all rescues. perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we all have a role to play here. Mm -hmm. What does prayer mean yeah. to you? Is the third question. Mm. Oh my gosh, I might cry. <laughs> prayer has saved my life. Um, thank God for mm. prayer. Uh, every day of my life, I have prayed. And that is something my parents taught me coming from a, a Pentecostal background, which is very oppressive, but thank God, God wow. for prayer. Um, <laughs> so every day I prayed. And when I found meditation, why it resonated with me so deeply when I found it when I was 15 is because what it was for me is prayer inward. And it allowed me to connect to the God wisdom that is in me and to recognize that I too am God um, intuitively. Um, I found more language for that since, but prayer is, is connection. It is very quickly 
when I was five, my mother told me that no minister, no man, no preacher could stand between me and my God Ooh. and that God always hears me, that God always hears me. And I had a, um, a vision of a red string going from my heart into the clouds because that's where God lives, of course. Of course. <laughs> and I had this vision. And every single time I pray, I see that vision. And it has prayer has allowed me to feel in all times that I am heard, I am supported, I am loved, and that I'm never alone. So prayer is everything. I talk to my God every day, all at all times, in every moment. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. In one of your posts recently, also you said that for every post you make that says you're praying for uh, a tragedy to be resolved. There are so many that come up every single week. Mm-hmm. Um, you were calling for real action, impactful real action, mm-hmm. instead of mm-hmm. that quote unquote prayer. And I wanted to sort of talk about that because I feel that I just don't know how to, how to, how to get there. So for me, prayer is the connection to our most powerful source, ourselves in our best and uh, most impactful. So when I pray, it's only to, it's kind of like, um, like a pep rally (laughs) to, to get Mm. up and go. So it's like that African proverb, when you pray, move your feet, um, or a, a, from the Bible, um, faith without deeds is dead. So when I pray, it's only to remind myself of how powerful I am and how, and how worthy I am and how I am put here on purpose for a purpose. So activism to me is prayer moving my feet. And I think everyone can be called to activism and everyone should be. And um, we are in crisis. Our brothers and sisters are in crisis and we need to be our brothers, our siblings keeper. We need to, to get up and do something. So I use, it's a, you know, old church thing, um, time, talent, treasure, you know, pick one of those categories and think about what you can do from, from each or just one. So how can I give of my time? We all have extra time. I have five kids. I got lots of time. I have a lot. Um, uh, you know, talent, we're, we're all good at something. How do we share that with the world? I use meditation. I, I love really well. I laugh a lot. So I use Mm -hmm. humor to, to share my, my message, um, and treasure. And that could be an abundance of whatever you have. Um, it's most certainly money, food, a, a space in your home, a room in your home. But yeah, give from one of those places. It's so easy. And do it every day. The fact that I've never heard time, talent, treasure is bothering me right now. It's very, very helpful. It's good. I spent a lot of time in church, yeah. like nine hours a week growing up. Wow. <laughs> so, it yeah, didn't, yeah, I, yeah. I have to say, it didn't hurt you. It didn't. No, because I took all the good sure parts did. of it. You know, Megan Waterson. Oh, the best. She's you know, coming our, on this podcast. Our, yeah, she I'm, is the best. The that best. Book, Mary Magdalene <laughs> Revealed, her new book, is blowing my heart open. Dude. Dude <laughs> I, I texted her and I was sobbing. I'm not a crier. I know I've mentioned crying a couple times. But I'm not a crier. I was sobbing. And I know that if my mother, who was such a Jesus-loving mm. woman... And who also carried so much shame about her sexuality, about who she was in the world. I know if she read that book, she would have been healed, mm. just just yep. healed. And I I read it for her. That I want. I'm starting to read it again. I read it out loud to my four year old wow. at bedtime. Um, it is a gift. She's, She's a, a gift. gift. Um, she is such a gift. I don't know why I started talking about her, but that was amazing. Oh, Megan says. Um, or the title of her book, part of it is The Christianity We Haven't Found Yet. Ah. So all the time that I was in church and she had this same experience, we're like, something's off. I love this, but there's something missing. Yeah, and she yeah. fills in those blanks with the story yeah. of Mary Magdalene. Yeah. I just <laughs> The latest book, though, is really a, tr- a, a serious treasure. Speaking of treasures. Um, okay, so last couple of questions. The the connection that we both have to Handel Group. Tell us about how that's helped you and what it means to you today. 
Um, I would say that the most profound effect that working with Lauren and the Handel method on me has been, it showed me how accept, to accept myself as being human and what humanity mm. actually means. So to love myself fully, to understand myself fully, to accept myself fully, that, but to stop being a liar. Cause man, I was such, I was such a liar in every aspect of my life to myself, to my kids, white lies, big lies, lies that hurt. And I didn't see it because they all had such good intentions. And it's made my life so much easier because communication is so clear. It's like a straight line between A and B every single time. And um, I don't lie anymore. I don't lie at all anymore about anything. It's the greatest freedom. And it feels so free. Yeah, it's the greatest oh, freedom. Yes. Liberation. Yeah. The truth will liberate us. Yes. What the hell were we doing all that time? I don't know. I'm not worried about so, it. It's so funny. When Lauren teaches, that's like her first line is you're a fucking liar. And it burns mm -hmm. at the beginning. It burns so hard because it's true. <laughs> And then you realize, why, why am I saying all these things? Why did I say I read that book? Why did I say I mean this when I mean that? Mm -hmm. What the hell is happening here? I think that you just teased out probably the biggest gifts that I got and continue to get from that work. So thank you for that. When is Managing the Motherload coming out? August 13th. As we're, yeah, as we're recording this, it's next week. I'm not ready. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but oh well it's happening it's like birth it's like oh i the baby has to come out so yeah yeah no it's like the 11th hour um are you gonna go on tour for the book or are you gonna stay in your house and do nope. facebook i'm gonna stay in my house and be a mom and and really i'm writing a children's book great or i have written a children's book and i'm self-publishing probably and um it's beautiful and that's really where my heart is right now, is um, speaking to the little ones. And yeah, it's gorgeous. I can't wait to send it to you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for such a dynamic and truth-filled conversation. I appreciate you. I appreciate your friendship. And I appreciate all the ways in which you're showing up for all of us, truly. Same, same. Thank you. Sending you so much love. <laughs> <laughs>